Welcome back to the Mandela Effect, everyone. And we're starting off with a real doozy. I and many others remember a book called The Portrait of Dorian Gray. It's a classic. That's how we remember it. But here's the original publication of it. And it's always been called The Picture of Dorian Gray. Oh my goodness. I'm shocked. I'm absolutely shocked. I've got one, too. Yeah. You know Frankenstein, the guy with the stitches on his forehead and the metal thing sticking out of his neck? Yo, well, I just found out that it's always been the doctor that made him is called Frankenstein. What? I know, right? I couldn't believe it either. In my universe, the monster was always the Frankenstein. Now, if, you've, or if you're well-read, you probably have heard of this book, and you're looking at this, and you're thinking, well, that's not how I remember it. No, if you think you're well-read because you've heard the titles of gothic novels from popular culture, then you're going to be thinking that. Or possibly if you're French. But if you're actually well-read in English, it's pretty damn unlikely you're going to think that. The picture of Dorian... No, it's the portrait of Dorian Gray. It's the portrait of Dorian Gray, okay? Portrait! No, it's le portrait de Dorian Gray. <coughs> Period. Period. So, when you have then hundreds of articles like this that say or reference the portrait of Dorian Gray, in the first paragraph. In retrospect, isn't it clear that Oscar Wilde's novel, The Portrait of Dorian Gray? No. The title of a novel is not decided by Christopher Rawson from the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette, writing about a musical of all things. Nor is it decided by any other lazy critic. It's decided by the title of the book. There's not one of these. There's 50. If you go on to newspapers.com, you can search by words. And so you have to then explain how all of these people, all these journalists got it wrong. Because they're journalists. That's what they do. <laughs> no, but really, I mean, some of them got it wrong because the other ones got it wrong. Or because people like you are getting it wrong. And they didn't bother to fact check. They've heard the same thing 10 million times because people just will not goddamn stop repeating the wrong title. So what do you expect? Now, as for why anyone gets this wrong, I've already pointed out that the French title actually is The Portrait of Dorian Gray. That's not the original title, of course. The book was originally English, but it's enough to already confuse some people. But going beyond just the title, because it's a good idea to read the book and not just the cover, there's only one time in the entire book where this painting is referred to as the X of Dorian Gray. And guess what it's called? The world shall never see my portrait of Dorian Gray. So again, what we have here is a case of some people's brains trying to make things more consistent. System. They read the book, they see the book calling it The Portrait of Dorian Gray, and referring to it as a portrait another 44 times or something. And they remember the book as being about a portrait. Makes sense to me. And I could also see people closer to the time of the original publication of the book being primed for confusion by the publication of Wilde's The Portrait of Mr. W.H. just one year earlier. People who read or knew about that story by the same author could easily confuse its very similar title. One other funny thing I found while I was looking around for what Mandela effect people are saying about this is this video where this guy is convinced that the presence of the phrase the portrait of Dorian Gray in a Marilyn Monroe movie doesn't serve as yet another reason why people might call the book that, but instead serves as some kind of evidence for the Mandela effect. The movie Seven Year Itch starring Marilyn, Marilyn Monroe, it's a pretty famous movie. I mean, people have been talking about it for years. And in the movie, they clearly call the famous story, The Portrait of Dorian Gray. Now, this is an extremely famous movie. It's a Marilyn Monroe movie, one of the biggest actresses of all time up to that point. And it's the movie with the most iconic image of her, with her white dress bellowing up. Actually, I should specify, the iconic image of it is not actually in the movie. It was taken while they were doing the movie. Don't go looking for it and think that it being missing is evidence of the Mandela effect. Point being, this is a movie a lot of people saw. And in the movie, one of the characters refers to the portrait of Dorian Gray. Not the book, the actual portrait, which is referred to in the book as the portrait of Dorian Gray. Well, my portrait of Dorian Gray, but yeah. One of these mornings you're gonna look in the mirror and that's all, brother. The portrait of Dorian Gray. So he's referring to the portrait the same way Oscar Wilde refers to the portrait, but considering that people like the creator of this Mandela Effect video think he was referring to the book, don't you think maybe some of the other millions of people who've seen this movie would as well? Doesn't that seem like it might cause just a bit of confusion? And you're still confused why some people might get this wrong? 
And also, I want you to think about something. When is the last time you heard anyone call a portrait a picture? Just a picture? I mean, normally, at least nowadays, we'd be more specific. We would say a painting or a portrait. It's not that common to just say this is a picture of someone. Possibly at one time it was, but certainly not today. Not in reference to a painting of a person. And people's brains are going to have a tendency to try to make things more specific and to make them consistent with common parlance. And so when some people have made this mistake for these reasons or other reasons, and they talk about the book and other people hear them talking about the book, well now the people who heard them talking are also less likely to remember the actual title because they heard someone referring to it by a different title. And if they're not actually actually well read but just think they are because they know the titles of some books, well they're even more likely to get it wrong. By the way, going back to the thing about the musical in that review, I tried to look up that musical to see if it's actually called The Portrait of Dorian Gray, but I think it's a little bit too obscure. If it is though, I could see the theater critic just saying, oh it's based on that book and the title is The Portrait of Dorian Gray, so yeah, the book, The Portrait of Dorian Gray. And there you go, that's exactly how I was talking about misinformation spreading. And then hell for all I know, maybe you learned about the book from something like this review, some place where someone else got it wrong because someone else got it wrong because someone else got it wrong and now you think you know better and you're insisting that the wrong title is right and now someone else is going to get it wrong because of you. Isn't that kind of an obvious chain of events in a society where most people assume that other people at least try to know what the fuck they're talking about? But no, right, people call a thing two different things and so there must be two universes where people call things different things. <laughs> and, and they didn't check their ad copy and no one picked up, the editors never picked up of 50 times and then wait so 50 times the editor of a newspaper didn't notice that their pointless culture column was written by some idiot who didn't even bother to check the title of a book that he referred to okay sure but it is one of the most well-known books in the english language how many times have people written about this book and got the title right i mean you're whining about a few typos from a few ignorant people but considering the amount this book has been referred to in any sort of mass media that seems like hardly anything not that that's that relevant i mean every columnist on earth could call it that that still wouldn't make your explanation true hundreds or even thousands of different categories we have these types of articles or different re sources of, of uh, what we call residual evidence. Yeah, you do like to call it that. It's funny, though, you know, that so much of the so-called residual evidence actually functions as part of the explanation for why you're wrong. It's kind of hilarious. I really like the Marilyn Monroe example because it's so widespread, just absolutely smashing the phrase the portrait of Dorian Gray into the public consciousness. It's a beautiful example of exactly how these kind of misquotations, or in this case, mistitlings, can start, or at least be propagated for far and wide. The newspaper examples aren't bad examples either. I mean, if the culture critic in the Philadelphia, what was it? Gazette something? The Pittsburgh Post-Gazette. I knew it was one of those. Must be the Mandela effect. If the person whose job it is to write about this stuff got it wrong, or if the person who titled the musical got it wrong, how many people do you think are going to read that article or watch that musical and get it wrong because they got it wrong? And then you say that this has happened 50 times or 100 or 1,000 times or whatever number you're coming up with. Well, that's even worse. Now you got a goddamn snowball effect. Yeah, sure, some people are going to actually know the title of the book and know that these people are just wrong, but other people aren't going to know that. And they're going to go away thinking that is the title of the book. And then other people are going to hear it from them. And maybe one of them is the next newspaper writer. See, you call it residual evidence. I call it a good explanation. It's unexplainable. It's statistically impossible. I want you to explain to me what that means to you, because I don't think it means what you think it means. So, that's a challenge. No, it isn't. I mean, you gotta think, man. You gotta, you gotta really think about this. I agree, so please do. And try to think your way out of the box. So you got this Dorian Gray thing, and you got it through all these articles, and then we're being told, oh, you're just misremembering. And we're like pulling our hair out. I don't know if you're misremembering. You could have just never known in the first place. And then you're just correctly remembering whatever you read in the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette. Whatever it is, though, it does not imply the existence of some alternate dimension where random, meaningless bullshit like book titles are slightly different but mean the exact same thing. So you understand that that type of event is unexplainable through natural causes. In my universe, it is explainable. So, yeah. Because all these people are remembering it the same. They got residual evidence. It's all the different topics. Isn't the topic the painting of Dorian Gray? What do you mean different topics? People's names, movie lines. 
with hundreds of examples in each category. Additionally, they're able to find the residual evidence. I mean, come on, it's just impossible. Really? Because at that point, it almost just sounds like a basic flaw in humanity. People have the ability to get things wrong. They have the ability to say one word when they mean another word that means something really similar, stuff like that. I know I do that in conversation all the time. And other people have a tendency to take people at their word and not necessarily go fact check every piece of literature that gets brought up in conversation, and thus misinformation spreads. If this happened only once in the entire history of humanity, it might be surprising. If individual and social memory tended to be basically perfect, and then there was suddenly a flaw showed up, it'd be an incredibly strange anomaly. But considering that, as you say, it's actually quite common, and oftentimes it occurs in cases where it actually makes quite a lot of sense, either in the sense of making spellings more consistent, or using more common terminology, bringing things more into line with the broader cultural context, or just confusing things that are easy to confuse, and so on and so on, I've talked about it, then it seems to fit perfectly well with the overall human experience. In fact, considering my interactions with humans, and with groups of humans, and with the mm, residual products of humans, let's say, media, and so on. I would actually be downright surprised if this kind of stuff didn't happen. It's almost amazing people don't fuck it up more. So, you may not agree that the Mandela Effect is really happening, but are you, are you under such a spell that you can't bring yourself to admit that what I'm laying out here is at least difficult to explain? Oh, that's not a loaded question at all, is it? Are you under such a spell that you think 2 plus 2 equals 4? Yes. Wait. No. Wait, damn it! How so many people would all spontaneously start to hallucinate like that? That would be hard to explain if a whole bunch of people started hallucinating the same thing at the same time. Yeah, that would be kind of difficult to explain, sure. But considering that has literally nothing to do with this topic in any way, and that's not a thing that's happening, who cares? I don't think you would be able to say that with uh, intellectual honesty. <laughs> I agree, yeah, I would have to be pretty intellectually dishonest to say hundreds of thousands of people having the same simultaneous hallucination was easy to explain. Good thing I'm not doing that. Whew, dodged a bullet there. Okay, and then, so you go into the data sphere, and you can, you can do research to determine how many people are claiming this Mandela effect. Oh no, Google Trends shows people are talking about the Mandela effect. That means my position really is irrational, because... It's using Google Analytics and gumshoe journalism. Holy shit, that's how you describe this? A little humility, bro, please. This is neither gumshoe nor journalism. This is no-shoe Googling. By analyzing the number of comments in different YouTube channels, by looking at the number of YouTube channels that speak exclusively about this and how many subscribers they have. Oh no, people are talking about the Mandela... Ah, I've already done that one. Oh no, people are talking about the That's Mandela. One yeah. we just... Oh, right, yeah. <laughs> That's the joke. Okay, yeah. So I went in and I found just a few 23,000, 11,000. This one has 128,000. There's tons of these. And these uh, YouTube channels cater specifically to this Mandela effect topic. So you have to assume that people don't subscribe to that unless they believe it. I'm subscribed to every single one of those. But most people aren't me, so roughly speaking, you're right on that. But okay, I can agree that the Mandela effect is a popular internet phenomenon. What does that have to do with whether or not it's true? And so the numbers are many times more than that, because a lot of people believe it and maybe don't subscribe. Could you get to the fucking point? So there is a large number and a growing number exponentially of people claiming this experience. Yeah, for every dumbass conspiracy theory, there's a whole lot of dummies who buy in. And therefore... <laughs> so what I've said up to now regarding the number of people claiming, to me, seems irrefutable. Well, I'm terribly sorry about that. What do you want me to do about it? And if you don't believe it, then you need to research it for yourself, and you'd have to produce evidence to prove that my research is flawed because I can document that there is a lot of people. The, the number is not zero. So wait, your argument is seriously just a lot of people believe what I believe and therefore it's true? Literally just an appeal to popularity? Okay, well in that case, there's a lot more atheists than people who believe in the Mandela effect. So God don't real, bro. Let's just assume that you'll agree 
that the numbers of people that are being affected is quite considerable and it would be alarming. <laughs> sure. Let's just assume that. Yeah, why not? Oh no, a lot of people believe a really dumb explanation for a really simple thing. What am I going to do? It's quite unexplainable. Are we still assuming I think that? Okay, just making sure. It's quite unexplainable! Oh. But you're firm in your position that the phenomenon is not exotic and that things are not changing, but rather it's one of three things. Bets on whether my thing's even one of them? You believe it's either a bunch of crazy people that are able to amplify their mental instability because of the internet. No, I don't think you're crazy. I do think you're exceedingly bad at critical thought, but that doesn't make you insane. It just makes you kind of not that bright. By the way, in my universe, there is spelled T-H-E-I-R. And I'm not trying to snootily correct you. I know you spelled it properly for your universe. Don't worry, man. Millions of people from your universe type it the same way every day. So it's not a big group. It's just a few that are able to seem like a lot. Is that still part of option one? Yeah, I don't really care if it's a big group, a small group. Doesn't make any difference, really. I guess the bigger the group is, the easier it is for them to confirm each other's biases and stuff. But really, it could be five people on a forum, it could be ten million, I really don't care. Or... You believe people are just misremembering. That's the majority of people that don't think this is real. Well, none of my explanations actually make misremembering the only option as such. That is for sure one of the things, possibly even the primary one, but there's a lot of different ways you can get a wrong answer, especially when there's other people around. In that case, there's a lot of different ways for a lot of people to get the same wrong answer. The third option is that you have ordinary, ordinarily normal people that have succumbed to some outward influence. Yeah, exactly. Culture, society, movies, TV, books, newspapers, magazines, linguistic standards, peer pressure, history, or people talking about the Mandela effect on the internet, and probably a bunch of other ones I haven't even thought of. Yeah, definitely outward influence is playing some role in this, for sure. Whether it be demonic, viral, or bacterial, or chemical, or some sort of mind control weapon. Oh. Those are really the only reasonable explanations that I could come up with. I know. And then the fourth one to explain this experience that all these people are claiming is that, in fact, it is something unexplainable. So you think people's explainable explanations are irrational, but your explanation is just, it's unexplainable, and that's the most rational explanation. How is that even an explanation? It's a sign and wonder. And you wonder why people have trouble taking your religion seriously. That's what we're claiming. We're claiming that it's an end time sign and wonder, just like the Bible told us it would happen. Couldn't you make up more rational signs and wonders, like lens flare planet X's? Of course the first three deny the fourth. Uh, and so let's look at these one at a time. Oh my god. Okay. Um, let me, uh, go drink another coffee first, I guess. So if you believe it's just a bunch of people that are crazy, and that there are, uh, many people, including Christians, that are gullible, influenced by Photoshop tricks, and who are insecure, so they gravitate to these types of things because it makes them feel special, uh... What you need to consider is that crazy insinuates a mental illness. What? You don't have to be crazy to be gullible, influenced by Photoshop, insecure, wanting to feel special. What the hell are you talking about? That has beset somebody, and that type of condition doesn't spread. It's not contagious, so you don't have tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of people suddenly becoming crazy. No, but there are millions of people who are gullible, easily influenced by Photoshop, insecure, want to feel special, willing to join Mandela Effect forums where people hype up their false memories. Hell, even people who are easily influenced to form false memories. This is not a limited problem, this is a chronic problem globally. And I still don't understand why you're lumping all those things in with crazy. That stuff is not having a mental illness. It's just not being that great at critical thought. And especially not all experiencing the same delusion naturally. False memories aren't delusions. They're not mental illnesses. I have them too. Everyone has them. I even have them to some extent about some of the things you Mandela Effect people talk about. Only difference is I realize I didn't have a perfect memory in the first place, even if it feels vivid. I'm not so up my own ass about it. For all I know with that stuff, it's possible I didn't have a very clear memory of it at all in the first place. Until somebody said it like, hey, did you know that that book, The Portrait of Dorian Gray, is actually called The Picture of Dorian Gray? And immediately when they start that sentence, my brain forms a memory like, yeah, it was portrait, because they said that, and I completed the incomplete information. And then they say, no, it's actually picture. I'm like, what are you talking about? I've always known it was portrait. 
right? Just like a deja vu. You know what a deja vu is, right? You remember extremely vividly having the same experience before, but you actually didn't. I'm not saying that's how you always get these memories, but sometimes for sure. That's why if you want answers from a witness that are as accurate as they possibly can be, which is still not necessarily that accurate, you try not to ask loaded questions, leading questions. You don't say, what type of green was the car? You say, what color was the car? If you do that, you can get people to say the wrong thing and believe it. Which is one reason why, like I said before, eyewitnesses are such terrible evidence. Human memory is just not reliable. It's not a goddamn camcorder. Camcorder. Shit. Okay, boomer. But these forums you people interact in are breeding grounds for this type of stuff. It's like a petri dish of fucked up memories. Anyway, thank you very much for joining me. I hope you'll come back and join me for part three. A huge thanks, as always, to my supporters on Patreon, Subscribestar, PayPal, and every other platform. See you next time. <laughs>